This poem uh, takes place in a farmhouse outside of Springfield, Missouri, where, where I taught for three years fresh out of graduate school. A really, really wonderful little city nestled in the Ozarks. It's called Firm Against the Pattern. When I saw Charity dancing alone in the farmhouse kitchen, eyes closed, lips parted, held aloft in one hand, half a mango, a gigantic butcher knife clutched in the other. I froze at the screen door as I always do when I come upon someone praying. All night I had been hitting on the daughter of a tiny woman orphaned by Hiroshima. Grandparents had been lost and the mother would soon be dead though no one knew if it was the blast or the facility she retired next to in Utah. This was the kind of bitter irony that made you want to burn the flag. Even if it was against the fourth, even if it was against the law, even on the 4th of July, on property owned by a Republican state senator, which is precisely what would happen later, after we drunk the wine. Hey, he said in one of those voices, unique to fraternity members, high on nitrous oxide, <laughs> anybody want a drink of hundred-year-old Romanian wine? Before we could answer, he had produced from one of the pockets on his wheelchair, wine he meted out, so help me God, from a Mrs. Butterworth's bottle. <laughs> By the time that bottle made its way around the bonfire, I was drunk on kimonos wed to atom bombs and motherless children left to cultivate an excruciating beauty, drunk on crippled tipplers scarcely larger than dolls. Like the wine my father fashioned, out of blackberries, out of plums. It was sweet and very strong, and it wouldn't have taken much to turn Mrs. Butterworth upside down until her skirts fell and I'd forgotten that the cloud above Nagasaki rhymes with the flag we raised on the moon. As I watched Charity dance, I rested my brow against the rusty screen, and that knife and mango might have been a bottle and a beating heart, a bomb and a burned up baby doll, a flag and whatever comes to mind when you read the word forgiveness. Closing my eyes, I extended my tongue and pressed it firm against the pattern. I tasted yesterday's rain, the carcasses of moths, broken glances, tears, the smoke of not-so-distant fires, all those desperate gestures we collect and call the seasons. This next poem bears a little explanation. Um, I live in in Christian County in western Kentucky and the next county to the east is Muhlenberg County which is one of the great birthplaces of country music. Um, you may have heard of it from the great John Prine song Paradise that mentions Muhlenberg County but it it, it may be better known uh, as the birthplace of the great western Kentucky thumb picking tradition best known in the person of Merle Travis, who wrote 16 Tons, Kentucky Means Paradise, all kinds of great coal mining songs. But there were three great proponents of, in the first generation of great Western Kentucky thumb pickers. There was Merle, there was a cat named Mose Rager, and there was a man named Isaac Everly, who some say was the best of the lot, but who kind of slipped through the cracks of history because he forsook his own musical ambitions 
to propel forward his two gorgeously beautiful, talented sons, Don and Phil, who you know as the greatest singers of all time, the Everly Brothers. <laughs> and uh, the arc of that life through like two generations, from Ike having worked in the mines to his two teenage sons being, you know, millionaire rock stars while they were still in high school. And if, if you've seen Muhlenberg County and, and what a gut bucket, depressed, hard-ass place to live it is, the idea of, of the Everly Brothers rising out of that pit is just, it blows my mind. And uh, one night I was strumming my guitar with the windows open and I found myself thinking about the Everly Brothers and I decided to try to work all this into a poem. It's called In Open G. There is a hole in my lap the sound comes out of, but there is no sound now. So I turn it upside down and shake, hear the pick's hollow rattle, hope for it to fall. I can't say if men still arm themselves with picks as they embark on their dark odyssey into the earth. But Egypt mines had an operation once when I first moved here, butted up against my land. On warm nights, windows open, there was a constant, distant rumble. Transparent voices that may or may not have bled into this world. Huge lunar contraptions emitting the mom-back beep of a garbage truck, which by light of day resembled nothing so much as dinosaur remains. It's less than half an hour from my house to the place where Isaac Everly rose from a pit, rubbed grit from his eyes and vowed no son of his would break his neck sucking blood from a stone, or sing a lifelong lonesome song underneath a mountain in blackface. Ike would drop his pick and pluck his sons from fields of green infinity, the place they had ever prayed and laid down weary heads, tried not to hear coal trains as they hauled away the planet's very pulse, a life Ike's boys would never have to learn, though they'd spend the rest of their days on earth grown filthy rich from singing songs of longing to return. <laughs>